Good evening, everyone. It's really great being in East County and telling you about the thing that I do day in and day out, dealing with the Colorado River and the different players at the river. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the river as a whole, the whole system, and sort of dovetail with what Dr. Fulp had talked about, and then concentrate more on California and how we interact with the river, and then, of course, to San Diego. So I want to start This is not what I was going to say. Okay, so today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about changes in the Colorado River Basin as a whole. And as I mentioned, it does um, sort of mirror a little bit with what Terry has been talking about but then I'm going to bring it down to California and what are some of the challenges that we have and then talk about the quantification settlement agreement. I'll let you know what it's all about and some of the wonderful water supply projects that we are getting water from. And lastly, I wanna to touch on some of the binational discussions that are ongoing. Terry touched on those a little bit during his talk, but there is something that pertains to San Diego specifically that I would like to talk to you about. Back to the basin map. Um, the map is really showing the upper basin, the four states at the upper basin. In the uh, clockwise order, it is um, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico. That's the upper basin. And the lower basin is Arizona, Nevada, and California. The reservoirs that Terry alluded to, um, Lake Powell in the upper basin, Lake Mead, the biggest reservoirs in the lower basin, and then you could see how the river flows from the through the United States, through Mexico, and down to the Gulf of Mexico. To the, to the lower, for you it will be the left-hand corner, is the California water users on the river. And I'm going to blow up this map so that we can talk about it a little bit more. So these are the main users uh, on the river. PVID, Palo Verde Irrigation District, has the first priority of the California users on the river. The Imperial Irrigation District in pink over there. And, and it is located south of the Salton Sea, the blue area in, uh, up above it. Then the Coachella Valley Water District. Metropolitan Water District, that takes up all of that green area, and the San Diego County Water Authority is part of that. And this map also shows the plumbing from the Colorado River to, our, to California. Down at the bottom, right by the border, is the All-American Canal that I will be talking about a little bit. And then if you move up uh, north of the PVID, you could see the California River Aqueduct that takes water from Lake um, from Lake Havasu all the way to the Metropolitan Water District. This also shows the Los Angeles Aqueduct and the California Aqueduct, both of the pipelines that, that bring water from the Northern California up to Metropolitan, then down to the San Diego County Water Authority area. I thought by putting this on a map, it really gives you a, a good feel of where all of these areas are and um, sort of helps me as I keep talking about the different aspects of um, the projects that we have on the river. Some water terminology, Terry alluded to that, an acre foot. Um, a lot of you work with water, so you definitely know what that is, but it's pretty much a football field that's one, f one foot of water deep. And then the quantification settlement agreement. I work with it so much that half of the time I forget that people don't really know what that is. Um, nicknamed the QSA, it's a set of agreements that help California bring its water use to the 4.4 that we were uh, allocated by the law of the river. And it's really quite complex and convoluted, but uh, I will talk a, a little bit about that and talk about some of the water supply that we have been able to uh, get to San Diego from that. 50 years of the river. Um, this is one of 
one of the, the charts that I really like to sort of talk about because it, it gives you an interesting perspective of the changes that have happened in the last 50 years. From 1962 to 2012, the demographics, the number of people who use the river, 12 million people back in 1962. We have about 30 million people, more than double the population in the last 50 years. The acres irrigated, uh, interestingly enough, it um, increased by a very small margin. So it's about 3 million acre feet in both instances. The storage capacity, Terry talked about when Lake Mead was built in the 1930s uh, with many other little reservoirs, we had about 30 million acre feet storage capacity. In 1967, Glen Canyon uh, Dam was finished, so the capacity pretty much doubled. And with that, the hydropower generation on the river as well. The natural system, how much flow was going in the river, this is looking at the 50 years prior to the 1962. So from 1912 to 1962, the annual mean natural flow was 15.5 million acre feet. In 2012, from 1962 to 2012, the mean, the mean annual flow dropped down to 14.4. The lowest 10 year average flow was 12.5, and even that had dropped down to 12. <laughs> So if one is to sort of follow the trend, you, kind of, you can sort of see where that's heading. Um, the most interesting piece in this is the legal uh, aspects. Uh, we had quite a few laws that were used to um, manage the river, operate the river, but I have to tell you, since 1962 to, uh, to 2012, it increased exponentially. We have so many national laws and so many complicated rules and regulations by which the river needs to be operated with makes things a lot more difficult. So again, this is a map of the basin, and uh, the reason I wanna show you this is to kind of talk about how much each basin is allotted to use from the river and how much uh, each state has been using on the river. So this is the apportionment. Terry mentioned that California's uh, share of that is 4.4 million acre feet. And Arizona is 2.8. Colorado on the average is 3.86. Of course, they're not nowhere close to using that. These are the deliveries. So in yellow is how much water each of these states had actually received. And you can tell from this chart that the only state that received higher than its allotment is California. That was the situation that we were dealing with in the 1990s. So what is the situation? What is California's water use pre-2003? And the reason I'm talking about 2003, this is when the quantification settlement agreement got approved. So it's the pivotal year where California's water use changed dramatically. We regularly exceeded uh, the 4.4 allotment that we have. As a matter of fact, in 37 of the 39 years preceding 2003, we've exceeded 4.4. So we were not only exceeding it occasionally, but our population growth and our industries were depending on using more than 4.4. And Reclamation was able to help us out because Arizona and Nevada were not using their full allotment, so we were able to get extra water. And then, of course, there was the growth that happened in Las Vegas. There was also uh, increased use in the upper basin. All of that made the other states and the federal government tell California, okay, guys, you need to shape up and you need to come up with ways to use the limit that you have, the 4.4. And then in 2001, there were interim surplus guidelines. And in those guidelines, there were some negotiations that helped California to have a soft landing so that we could gently come down to our 4.4 use limit. 
This is a map showing the plumbing that we have um, more specifically in the Imperial Irrigation District and where the Salton Sea is. The, um, the, can the All American Canal starts from the river and heads east, as you can tell, and then um, there's a Coachella Canal that takes water up north, north of the Salton Sea, and heads all the way to the Indi El, El Indio and the Coachella area. <coughs> Most of this area is the Imperial Irrigation District, and that is the area where San Diego gets the conserved water from, from both that the, the, uh, the um, irrigated area as well as the canal <coughs> projects from that. Uh, area. So the QSA in 2003 was able to quantify our um, the, the uses, the agricultural uses on the river. And by this quantification, we were able to come down to our 4.4 million acre feet. It also allowed the ag to urban water transfers and it also funded canal lining projects which are the two sources where San Diego gets its water from. So what is the significance of the QSA for California? It reduced our use to the 4.4, and it also, by the fact that it quantified how much each agency gets, we, each, each of these agencies really got reliability and got this um, um, security that they will, they are able to develop and do whatever they need to do with that much water. That no one, no other entity would come, no court would come and say, you're using too much or you're wasting water, we're going to take it away. So it provided that type of uh, security to the different agencies. By knowing how much water we have, we, and, and increasing some of that, the transfers that we had, we we're able to reduce our reliance on the water from the north, from the Bay Delta. So by, by the QSA allowed the water agencies that use the water from the Colorado River to uh, achieve that. And a really important fact that most people don't recognize is that the QSA uh, provided mechanisms to fund both mitigation and restoration for the Salton Sea. Terry mentioned that the Salton Sea was really created as a result of, of an accident, of an overflow of the river. And in historical times, it used to dry out, and then when the river overflowed in that direction again, it would be created again. Where ever since we built the dams, there is no more flooding of that nature. And the only reason that the Salton Sea has been sustained is with the agricultural runoff that happens. Um, so, with the transfer of water that we are doing in the valley, there is less water going because we're being more efficient with the water use. Less water is making its way to the sea. The QSA, in fact, has um, uh, provisions in it that mitigates all of that impact, and it also set millions of dollars aside for the restoration of the Salton Sea and the state and the other agencies are engaged in looking at that. I'm sure you've, you read about this in the, in the news all the time. It's a pretty um, um, live subject right now that uh, many people are talking about. So now we're done with California. We're coming to San Diego. What is the significance of the quantification settlement agreement to San Diego? The biggest um, advantage, the biggest thing that we got out of the QSA is the uh, Imperial Irrigation District to San Diego water transfer. And um, we are in a ramp up schedule right now. In 2012, we are scheduled to receive 90,000 acre feet, but by the year of 2021, we are scheduled to receive 200,000 acre feet, and it continues for 45 years. So it's a pretty large amount of water that we will be getting from the Imperial Irrigation District. So far, we have received 410,000 acre feet from 2003 until now. And the unit cost for the water that we're paying is $491 an acre foot this year. 
the other big thing that San Diego received from the quantification settlement agreement is the canal lining projects water. The two canals, the All American Canal that I showed you uh, previously on the map, mm -hmm. and the Coachella Canal have been on the books for about 20 years. Um, different water users looked at them, but you know it obviously costs money to to line these projects and conserve the water. When the quantification settlement agreement got approved, the state of California allocated 200 million dollars for the lining of both of the canals. And San Diego then, as part of the agreements, uh, went into a contract that we would pay above and beyond whatever it would cost to actually line these projects. Uh, happy to tell you that both projects are finished and we are uh, in the process of receiving the conserved water. We have been since uh, Coachella Canal ended construction in 2006 and, to th uh, and the All American Canal ended in 2010 and we've been receiving the water ever since. Um, I also added here the total amount of money that it cost us to, um, to pay for the projects. This water supply is going to be the 78,000 acre feet will be coming to San Diego for 110 years. And the only, the only um, cost uh, for San Diego is to pay for the operation and the maintenance of the of the whole project, which is somewhere between ten dollars to five dollars an acre foot. So it's really a, a wonderful, reliable supply at a at a really good cost for us. I have some pictures here that I wanted to share with you for those of you who have not been east of the mountains and uh, driven to Yuma or even uh, east. This is a shot of the All-American Canal, and um, it's really a, a pretty magnificent sight if you're out there. Um, in the desert, you have this uh, blue strip of water that extends for miles and miles and miles. The project was to line 23 miles, um, and we have um, done that actually within budget and uh, within schedule, and we're quite happy with the result. This is a shot of the Coachella Canal. Um, this is a good shot because it really shows where the white, air, the white uh, alignment is the new line, concrete line canal, and the blue one is the existing one. If you are out there today, you would see that the water is flowing in the, in the white canal right now, the, the lined one, and the other one is um, pretty empty. Um, this is a, uh, a shot showing the, the cross sections of the canal uh, pretty much. The new canal is a smaller cross section because um, water would flow a lot easier in a concrete section without much friction, so we didn't need that big of a canal. And the spoils from digging the, the uh, canal, we deposited some of them in the, in the um, uh, existing uh, cross section. The projects, the, the whole idea of the projects was to line a canal uh, with concrete to stop the water from seeping. So you can imagine that a lot of the water that seeped before was sustaining life uh, and had a lot of environmental impact. In 2006, we finished construction of the project. We're still working on some of the mitigation projects, um, which are extensive because in the desert, it only takes a little bit of water to have a lot of life happen. So I have some shots here of some of the mitigation uh, aspects uh, of the project. Um, there is an area that's called uh, aqua farms where you have oases in the desert and some of the water that was seeping from the canal was actually feeding the oases. So we had to design and build a water supply project that mimics some of that environment so, so that some of the endangered species that were impacted with the project could, be, um, could have an environment to live in. Deer and bighorn sheep used to come to the canal and drink from it. And now that we have it lined with, with uh, concrete, if they try to go down, they slip and fall and they have no way of getting out. So we ended up having to fence the canal and to provide water drinkers. They're like little pools. 
believe it or not, they have cameras to show that the animals are actually drinking from these um, water drinking pools. Uh, so this is for large mammals, but the, it has other users uses as well. Um, you have boys fishing out there in the desert and then swimming as well. So I guess they are large mammals also. <laughs> so we were chugging along. Uh, actually, in 2003, when the agreements were signed, almost immediately there were lawsuits that were filed. And these lawsuits tr went through the proceedings and the courts and so on. And, and in 2009, uh, the Superior Court ruled that the QSA was invalid. It was a pretty huge shock for the, all, all the water agencies that are uh, partners in the QSA. And we worked really hard to make the point that, in fact, that the state's obligation is not, not constitutional and that um, we believe that the QSA should continue. We were very successful that the Courts of Appeal in 2011 was able to reverse that and uh, we are still awaiting. I mean, the trials are not finished. We're going to be going into the CEQA trial next. But another good news um, is that in April, which is just last month um, of this year, the, uh, there was a lawsuit on the NEPA, which is the federal environmental aspect. And um, the judge ruled in the agency's favor. So we were uh, fairly happy with that. That, of course, is on appeal as well. So we'll see how that goes. Since we started doing the transfer and doing a lot of environmental projects, we've learned a lot um, of things that really make sense for us to go back and make some changes. More specifically, the Salton Sea. As I mentioned to you, the uh, quantification settlement agreement mitigates the impact of the transfer uh, on the environment and the Salton Sea. And when we were negotiating the agreement, we really did not know, we didn't have the practical knowledge of what works and what does not work. So in our negotiations with the regulatory agencies, we came up with certain things that we agreed to. Well, as we have been implementing them, it became evident that some of the, the mitigation measures that we came up with are not very effective and are not, very, are not working very well. So because of that and because of understanding more about air quality impacts and so on, the Water Authority, in partnership with the, irrigation, with the uh, Imperial Irrigation District, has applied to the State Water Resources Control Board to, to modify some of the mitigation requirements. And um, the, the petition pretty much asks, um, right now we are scheduled to, de to deliver a very large quantity of water into the Salton Sea. It has a long story. Initially, the plan was for the state to come up with a restoration plan, fund it, and restore the sea. And everybody believed, including the state, that by 2017, the state would be well on its way in restoring the sea. Well, unfortunately, the state is nowhere close to that point right now. And we recognize that putting water in the sea is very costly and is not very effective as far as the habitat goes. So we are proposing to the State Water Control Board that we no longer put uh, water into the sea, that some of that water would be sold to either San Diego or Metropolitan, and the proceeds from those sales would be used to do better and more efficient and, and stronger um, habitat mitigation for habitat and air quality. Um, right now we are in the environmental analysis phase and we hope to be in front of the state control board sometime in the middle of next year. That is the hope for that. The next thing I wanted to, uh, to talk to you a little bit about is the binational activities that are going on. Terry had alluded to that a little bit. The United States and Mexico since has been in um, quite a bit of discussion since 2007. And um, 
the, the uh, nature of the discussion is to try and come up with ways to partner on management of the river. We are neighbors, uh, there's a border between us and, and Mexico, we're, we're both dependent on the river, and if we can help each other manage the resource <coughs> better, both will win. That is the premise that we have started the negotiations on. Some of the binational projects that we have discussed uh, have included a variety of things, some operational projects, some conservation projects, but the project that I really want to talk to you a little bit about is the desalination uh, project that is being proposed at the Rosarita Beach uh, area. So Mexico, uh, in, in 2005 there was a study done between the state of California and um, the Republic of Mexico to look at the possibility of building desalination plants. And um, the top location for the Republic of Mexico was in Rosarita, right by a, uh, an electrical plant. It already has an, out, an inlet structure and it has an outlet structure for water. And it is the ideal location to put a, um, a desalination plant. So Mexico approached the United States and said, Remember the results of that study, we want to look at this again. The United States responded favorably and there was a partnership between San Diego County Water Authority, Metropolitan Water District, um, the state of Arizona and the state of Nevada to collectively study the possibility, the feasibility of putting a facility like that. The capacity of the facility was going to be 50 to 75 million gallons per day and uh, the plan was to do a study that would be four phases and we all embarked on the first phase of the study. The first phase showed that there were really no fatal flaws. Um, there was plenty of demand in both Mexico and the United States. About 50 MGD could be used up by both countries um, once the plant is built immediately with the possibility of expanding to 75 later on. There was land close to the uh, energy plant that where, where that could be built and that there was sufficient electrical power. The plant was producing enough power that would cover the operations of a plant. Um, the thinking was that we would look at two ways of uh, producing water or utilizing the water. Water would be utilized in Mexico, in Rosarita, in Senada, in Tijuana and then the water would either be piped directly to San Diego, crossing the border, or water would be uh, left on the river, on the Colorado River, and uh, Nevada, for instance, could use that water while Nevada would pay for the, for the building and the operations of the plant. So next steps. We are... Um, Mexico right now, after, after we finish the first phase, Mexico, by, by looking at the results, decided that it's a, an extremely important priority for them. They put in money and right now are in the process of studying different pipeline alignments. They've also set money aside to look at the environmental impacts and so on. On the U.S. side, we are in negotiations uh, to try and come up with a large deal, so we're seeing how that goes before we proceed with the study. And uh, we're, we're, we're hoping that that could be finalized so that we can move forward on that. And I bring you back to uh, our um, diversification slide. Um, Mike had that definitely talked about today we get more than quarter of our supply from the canal lining projects and from the uh, water transfer. By 2020, it's going to be more than a third of the supply that we get. So it's, it's a very important resource for us in the county. And um, we're working very closely with the Bureau of Reclamation and the other seven basin states to make sure that San Diego's interests are protected and we continue to receive this water.